Bible says in Psalm 150, praise ye the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in the firmament of his power, praise him for his mighty acts, praise him according to his excellent greatness, praise him with the sound of the trumpet, praise him with the psaltery and harp, praise him with the timbrel and dance, praise him with stringed instruments and organs, praise him upon the loud cymbals, praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. once more to your services here at Grange Baptist Church. We're praying for the Lord's blessing to be upon us today in every aspect of our services and we're praying for indeed his presence to be known in each of our lives. It's Palm Sunday today and so it's a day in which we remember of course the triumphant entry into Jerusalem of our Lord Jesus Christ and that path that would ultimately lead him to the cross there in Calvary to purchase a salvation full and free and the redemption of all who know him and love him as Lord and Saviour. And so as we come to the Lord in prayer this morning, let us come with a note of thanksgiving indeed to, to the one who has triumphed, triumphed over all, hell, death and the grave and one day shall truly triumph over time itself and we shall be forever with the Lord. Let's come and praise our God today. Father, we just want to thank thee and praise thee for everything that thou hast blessed us with in Christ. 
We thank thee, Father, for thy word which records even how he stepped into time, how he lived the sinless life, how, O Lord, even upon this earth he reached out with love and compassion to all that he ministered to, ministered among. He reached out to publicans and sinners. He knew what it was to touch the eyes of the blind, made the lame to walk, opened the ears of the deaf. He raised the dead to life. And then as he entered into Jerusalem, his face was fixed as a flint to go to the cross. And Lord, we're thankful that that cross was that upon which he took and carried our sorrow and he bore our sin. By his stripes today we are healed. We stand redeemed, not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but by the precious blood of the Lamb. We thank thee today that the blood has lost none of its power. It still speaks for each one of us. We praise thee and we thank thee that that blood is able at this very moment even to cleanse the vilest sinner and make them clean. Oh, Father, speak in our services today. May the praise of God be upon each of our lips. May we worship thee from hearts that are full and overflowing. And in all that is said and done, praise and glory would be brought to thee and to thee alone. May the Lamb see of the travail of his soul be satisfied in all that is done this day. We'll praise thee and we'll thank thee for it. In Jesus' name, amen.
remember our gospel service this evening at 7 p.m. Once more, there'll be a children's talk in that hour, and we're looking forward to being able to broadcast the good news of the gospel once more. Wednesday evening, we'll be here in the building for our prayer meeting and Bible study at 8 p.m., and you be faithful in your attendance as you feel led of the Lord to do so. Next Sunday, God willing, being Easter Sunday, we will reconvene for public worship here in the building both morning and evening. And so at 12 noon and at 7 p.m., we're meeting together here in the church for our services. We're praying for the Lord's blessing to be upon us as we come uh, to rejoice in the truth of the resurrection. And you be sure to join with us even as we come next Sunday together to praise the Lord. And we pray that the Lord will continue to bless each one of us even through these times and lead us and guide us according to his perfect will. May God bless even the remainder of this service today. Corinthians chapter 11, and we'll just be reading verses 23 to 26. For I have received the Lord 
that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. Amen. Now, this morning I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about the various names that we give to this particular portion of our Sunday worship and just what I think they mean. Uh, firstly, I want to talk about um, it's one that we often don't speak here. Um, we often don't refer to this, and that is the fellowship meal. As the name implies, it is a meal to be enjoyed by a close fellowship. There are various samples of this sort of meal throughout the Bible, such as the peace offerings in Leviticus 3, but a particular and more prominent example would be the feeding of the 5,000 in Matthew chapter 14. We are all familiar with this account and how Jesus takes a humble lunch offering and turns it into a sustenance for many. It is, however, later in this account in John chapter 6, where Jesus refers to the true bread of heaven. Verse 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Here, Jesus is drawing a direct comparison between himself and life-sustaining bread. Jesus is the source of eternal life. The bread will ensure we never hunger again, but are fulfilled in him. The message of the feeding of the thousand, 5,000 reminds us that coming to the fellowship meal is not a dinner party or some extravagant meal for kings and queens. Um, it is a simple meal and it's meant to be shared amongst friends to remind us of the life-sustaining power of Jesus. And the idea of simple food is also shown in another name, and that's the breaking of the bread. Uh, for such a mundane thing to symbolise the body of our sovereign king is a wondrous and humbling thing to think about. As we read earlier in 1 Corinthians, at the Last Supper, when Jesus ate with his disciples, he broke the bread and gave it to each of them. He called the bread, my body, which is for you. He instructed them to break bread together and drink wine together, which symbolised the new covenant, blood, Christ, in remembrance of him. The shared meal was a beautiful picture of our unity with Christ and with one another as believers. When we break the bread, we share it. Uh, we are remembering that each of us is able to live and grow spiritually because his body was broken on the cross. The loaf that we share and the cup that we drink from represents the shared experience and the shared faith that we all enjoy. Now, another name, uh, though not widely used by ourselves in the Baptist Church, is the Eucharist. Uh, now, this word comes from the Greek word Eucharistia, and it means Thanksgiving. Um, when you take communion and go before the Lord's table, is an act of pure thanksgiving. It is the time to give thanks for the greatest gift and sacrifice ever made, the death and life of Jesus on our behalf. Luke 22 is the story of the Last Supper where Jesus broke bread and shared wine with his disciples before his crucifixion. And several times throughout the passage, it reads that he gave thanks or Christio as the symbolic body and blood of Christ was passed. I know we often come to you with a sombre tone, and for the most part, that's correct. But we must also rejoice, give thanks, and be glad for the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus, for going to the cross for our sins and our iniquities. Uh, a more familiar term, of course, would be communion, which I used earlier. Um, we all know that this word relates to people coming together, uh, but within the church circle, it represents God's people ourselves coming together to commune with one another as a fellowship. The early church celebrated Jesus by taking communion uh, sometimes every day and they continued daily with one accord in the temple 
and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Acts 2 verse 46. They saw that every time they gathered around a table to eat and drink, it was a chance to recognise Jesus and thank God for all he's done. It is a corporate event among the church family and it should be seen as an expression of our unity together as a fellowship as well as with God and Christ Jesus. Now, a phrase that may not be as common for everyone would be the memorial, with memorialism being the belief that the elements are symbolic rather than the literal body and blood of Christ. Rather than taking a place on a weekly basis, uh, like the other examples and what we're, we're familiar with, the memorial is held on a yearly basis and it's be held on the day of Passover itself. Uh, the reason uh, it's annual comes from Luke 22 verse 19. Uh, which has sometimes been translated um, in other versions of the Bible as do this in memorial of me rather than in remembrance of me. Uh, because the event took place on Passover, it's the belief, belief of some that Jesus' sacrifice should be remembered and celebrated on that day. The Passover was instituted by God to be a memorial of his deliverance of the Israelites from Egyptian bondage Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper as a memorial for the deliverance from sin he would give from those who trust in him. Um, however, that's not our belief. Uh, it's not what we usually refer to it as. Uh, we would normally refer to it as the Lord's Table or the Lord's Supper. Now, have you ever given any real thought as to why we call it by those names? Well, it's simple. We call it by those names because it was his idea, it was made possible by his death and his resurrection, and he is the host, the divine host, and we have been invited to eat, drink, and rejoice at his table. It is our source of spiritual nourishment and the time of the week that we should feel closest to God and to Jesus, regardless of what we've done and what sins we've committed. I'd like to finish by reading uh, part of Psalm 51. Just said. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in my sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I have shaven in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the, in, in the inward parts and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways. The sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. Thy God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. Amen. Now there's three phrases there that really stick out to me. And that is, cleanse me, restore me, deliver me. By partaking in the Lord's table, we are cleansed from our sin, we are restored to faith, and we are delivered unto Christ's waiting arms. Our awareness of sin should not keep us from the Lord's table, it should drive us towards it. Thank you.
take with me your Bibles this morning and turn to Job in the chapter 11. The book of Job, the chapter 11, we're going to read through this chapter together beginning at the verse 1. The word of God says, Then answered so far the Namathite and said, Should not the multitude of words be answered? And should a man full of talk be justified? Should thy lies make men hold their peace? And when thou mockest, shall no man make thee ashamed? For thou hast said, My doctrine is pure, and I am clean in thine eyes. But O that God would speak and open his lips against thee, and that he would show thee the secrets of wisdom, that they are double to that which is. Know therefore that God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserveth. Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven, what canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. If he cut off and shut up or gather together, then who can hinder him? For he knoweth vain men, he seeth wickedness also. Will he not then consider it? For vain man would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's colt. If thou prepare thine heart and stretch out thine hands toward him, if iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away, and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. For then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot, yea, thou shalt be steadfast and shalt not fear. Because I shall forget thy misery, and remember it as waters that pass away. And thine age shall be clearer than the noonday. Thy shalt shine forth, thy shalt be as the morning. Thy shalt be secure, because there is hope. Yea, thy shalt dig about thee, and thy shalt take thy rest in safety. Also thy shalt lie down, and none shall make thee afraid. Yea, many shall make suit unto thee, but the eyes of the wicked shall fail. They shall not escape, and their hope shall be as the giving up of the ghost. Amen, and we'll end our reading there at the verse 20. As we come to consider this third character, the man by the name of Sophar, I want to remind you that if you're seeking to compile a little uh, overview of the book, some notes that feed into that brief outline of all that the book of Job is about, then week by week you need to summarize the characters that we come to. We've looked at Eliaphas, we've looked at Bildad, we come now to Sophar. And then in weeks to come, we'll deal with Elihu and indeed Job himself. And they uh, feed into that general overview of the book under the title of the main characters. And so I trust that that is something you're able to do and indeed something that you will find useful in time to come. But nevertheless, as we come to consider so far this morning, it may be true to say that you haven't been able to identify in the characters that we have dealt with already. There hasn't been much in Eliaphas or Bildad that you can say that uh, indeed applies to me. Or indeed when it comes to considering the battles that they personify, the battle of self or the battle of shallowness. Again, it's something that you think to yourself, well, I don't exactly see how I fit into that. Well, I can guarantee that we all will find something in so far this morning that applies to all of our hearts. For so far is a man whom coming face to face with in the word of God this morning he acts like a mirror. And for many of us, we will see something of ourselves. And for some of us, we'll see more of ourselves and so far than we really ever countenanced. But nevertheless, I pray that as we come to the word of the Lord, we come with an open mind, we come with an open heart, and we allow God to speak truth into our souls even this morning. This man by the name of so far is a man once again who seems intent on being as harsh and injurious as possible. Remember, he comes as Job's friend. But everything that we shall behold is anything but the actions or indeed the words of a friend. And no doubt as we take these three characters together, they thought that what they were involved in, this counsel that they were offering, these discussions that they were having with Job, this was simply tough love. This was their way of showing that they truly cared even for Job and they entered in in some way to understand or to sympathize with the situation that he found himself in. But I suggest to you that as we come to consider these three men, we are reminded of something far more pertinent than that. And it's something that we all struggle with in different areas of our lives, at different times of our lives, with different people in our lives. But nevertheless, it's this truth, I believe, that these three characters remind us of and serve to us as an everlasting reminder of. And that is the truth of how easy it is to be a critic, but how hard it is to be correct in our criticism. Oh, it's very easy for all of us, myself included, 
to be a critic, but it's very hard, almost nigh impossible at times, to be correct in our criticism. So far appears to be the angriest of the three friends. Perhaps that's because he has sat and listened as the conversation has ebbed and flowed. He's heard the responses of Job. He's heard how this man doesn't seem to be willing to accept nor agree with any of the counsel that has been already offered. Perhaps it's just a true representation of his character. But nevertheless, his words are marked by aggression. His words are marked indeed with a heightened sense of urgency. He speaks with no sympathy. He speaks with absolutely no empathy. Rather, it's all conducted in a manner that's marked by bitterness and sensitivity and rudeness. And here in the recorded words of so far, we see the hallmarks of our third battle. For the counsel of so far typifies for us this morning the battle of supposition. The battle of supposition. So far as a man that I have no hesitation in saying came with the assumption that Job was guilty. And therefore, because Job was guilty, this was the reason that he was a recipient of righteous judgment from God. Nothing that had been said already as he had spent that time with Job, listening to the friends, sitting in his presence, altered in any way this assumption. Rather, his speech is marked by one whose heart continually hardens. And he characterizes someone who finds themselves in an entrenched position. And he has this attitude, Job, you're wrong, I'm right. Job, you're wrong, we're right. So far, his counsel has one overwhelming trait. It's a trait of accusation. And it's that trait that we want to place under the microscope this morning. We want to consider his counsel, but we want to look very specifically at the accusations that he brings. I want to see, first of all then, unfounded accusation. Unfounded accusation. To see this, we'll have to dissect this 11th chapter uh, just a little bit and the time permitted to us. Here in verses 1 to 6, as we read through them, should, in verse 2 we begin, Should not the multitude of words be answered? Should a man full of talk be justified? Job, I'm going to speak now. All that you've said, I need to respond to it. All these words that you're uh, throwing out into the ether, I need to give you a response to all that I have heard. Should thy lies make men hold their peace? When thou mockest, should no man make thee ashamed? For thou hast said, My doctrine is pure, I am clean in thine eyes. And here, as he says to Job, he says, Job, what you have said is not going to go unanswered. Job, for you there's no vindication, because, Job, all you have said is lies. Lies that you have tried to use to cover over the real truth here. That you are one who is guilty. And as a man who is guilty then, you are deserving of the judgment that God has brought upon you. Then he goes on and he doubles down on this assumption. He says in uh, verse uh, 4, he says, for, my doctrine, for thou hast said, my doctrine is pure, I am clean in thine eyes. But oh, that God would speak and open his li uh, lips against thee, and that he would show thee the secrets of wisdom, that they are more than double to that which is. Here he's saying, if God would speak, he would say exactly the same. So in these first six verses, we see an unfounded accusation. What is it? An accusation of guilt. Job, you're the guilty one here. I believe it, all my friends believe it, and if God himself was here, he would confirm it. Job, you're guilty. And so the first unfounded accusation we identify there in verses 1 through 6 is an accusation of guilt. But notice with me then in verses 7 through 12, we not only have an unfounded accusation, the accusation of guilt, but we come to a second accusation, an accusation of naivety. An accusation of naivety, verses 7 through 12. He says, Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell. What canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth, broader than the sea. If he cut off and shut up or gather together, then who can hinder him? For he knoweth vain men. He seeth wickedness also. Will he not then consider it? For vain man would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's colt. Here in these verses, as he's accusing Job of naivety, he reminds Job of his limited ability to truly understand God. 
He identifies that Job's knowledge of God was finite. And everything he says, especially there in verses 7 and 8, is accurate. But once more, the truth, the accurate statements that they they offer unto Job, they're being weaponized and used simply to serve as evidence of their supposed guilt that Job has. Because here he's speaking about truth that so far himself can't comprehend. Can we, any of us, by searching, find out God? Can't we find out the Almighty unto perfection? The answer is no. It's as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell. What canst thou know? We're all limited in our ability to understand truly who God is and how he works in this world. Verses 9 through 12, then, he states that Job is, just as he's unable to fathom his greatness, so too, then, he's unable to, Uh, to understand, and indeed he suggests that he's underestimated God's knowledge and God's justice. So in essence he's saying, Job, you can't figure out who God is. You can't truly understand how God works. And because you don't know who God is, because you can't truly understand how God works, then you also don't know the truth about why God is dealing with you. How much he truly knows about you and your life and how much then you are deserving of the the judgment that he has brought upon you. All through it, he's encouraging Job, stop being stubborn. Confess your wrongdoing. Stop mocking God and just confirm that you're guilty. Notice already in this chapter that so far peddles and misinformation, generalizations, He's putting words into Job's mouth. He's misrepresenting all that Job has said. And all along, I believe that he's simply trying to guilt trip Job into agreeing with his counsel, with their counsel. All along, he's trying to guilt trip Job into confirming his supposition, his assumption that Job was guilty. There was nothing else to it. He does it by accusing him, accusing him of being guilty, accusing him now of being naive. But notice with me then in verses 13 through 19, there's another accusation he brings. Not only guilt, not only naivety, but here in verses 13 through 19, we see an accusation with motivation. An accusation with motivation. He says, If thou prepare thine heart, stretch out thine hands toward him. If iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away. Let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. For then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot, yea, thou shalt be steadfast and shalt not fear, because thou shalt forget thy misery and remember it as waters that pass away. Thine age shall be clearer than the noonday, thou shalt shine forth, thou shalt be as a morning, and thou shalt be secure, because there is hope. Yea, thou shalt dig about thee, and thou shalt take thy rest in safety also. Thou shalt lie down, none shall make thee afraid, yea, many shall make suit unto thee. This is an accusation with motivation. Why? Because unfounded accusations are all motivated by one thing. A desire to coerce Job into doing what so far believed he should. That was repent. So far together with Eliphaz, together with Bildad, they were all convinced he was guilty and they all believed he needed to repent. And so his accusation had a motivation. All of these unfounded accusations he's bringing time after time to Job. They're all motivated by a desire to coerce Job into repenting. All three friends really were relentless in their attack, weren't they? Time after time, one after another. They're all along seeking just to, uh, as it were, force a confession from Job. They typify in many ways, don't they, three bad detectives in a movie or a television show. They've got their suspect in custody and they're doing everything they can to extract the confession from them as if their lives depended upon them. That's exactly what these uh, three friends are doing to Job, is it not? They're berating him in a manner as if they have to achieve their goal, get Job to repent. That's all they seem to be interested in. Unfounded criticism, unfounded allegation, and now unfounded accusation has all been leveled at Job, seeking to prove the point that they are right and he is wrong. This not only is evident in this chapter, but of course as the story progresses. And I remind you that this is all proof 
of the statement that was made a number of weeks ago that if there was ever any possibility of Job losing his testimony, if there was any possibility of Job cracking under the pressure and of giving in and doing exactly what Satan desired him to do, then it was always at the hands of these three friends. Never at the, as a result of the trials, but rather at the hands of these three friends. They were relentless Time after time they berated him, they accused him, and they leveled accusation, criticism, and allegation at him. But nevertheless, Job endured. That is a real lesson and a real testimony to us of one who is able to endure despite the hardships of life and indeed despite the misinterpretation and the misrepresentation of others. The motivation of his attack is simply found in the verses that we read together. Verse 13, If I prepare thine heart, stretch out thine hands toward him. Search your heart and pray, Job. Verse 14, If iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away. Let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. Put away sin. Put away anyone who is in your life and associate it with sin. And don't you be associated with sin. Now in verses 15 through 19, forgiveness will be known. If you repent, if you search your heart, if you pray, if you put away the sin, if you put away your association with sin, then forgiveness will be known and the peace of God will once more be experienced. That's why he was able to say, also thou shalt lie down, verse 19, none shall make thee afraid, yea, many shall make suit unto thee. So he's saying, Job, search your heart and pray. Job, put away your sin. If you do all of that, then forgiveness will be known, the peace of God will be experienced. You say to me, what's wrong with that? Absolutely nothing. It's good advice, no doubt about it. But it's misapplied, no doubt about it. And that provides the key to understanding all that is indeed unfounded about the accusations he brings here. Remember, Job lived around the times of uh, Abraham and thus lived in the days of the dispensation of human government, the dispensation of promise. So therefore he lived in a time whenever the law of Moses had not yet been instituted. So Job, under the economy that he lived, had a personal duty to confess his sin. He had a personal duty under that economy to make the required restitution to God for that sin. And remember, we noted also in chapter 1 that under that economy, he had the responsibility and the duty to act as priest for his family. So then everything that Job uh, was being implored to do here by so far was correct. To search his heart, to pray, and to make restitution to God, to put away his sin, and then forgiveness would be known in that moment as restitution was made. All of that was accurate, and all of it was correct if sin was found. Surely from everything we've looked at, we all agree that there was no sin evident in the life of Job. There was no unconfessed sin in Job's life. So far, rather than was making all of this assumption that Job was guilty, it was all supposition. The counsel he offers was all based upon that supposition, based upon that assumption. And his counsel then is incorrect. You only have to remember the very opening statements of the book where heaven records, God, God himself recorded, that Job was a perfect and an upright man, one who feared God and one who eschewed evil. And so in Job's life, as God looked at it, there was no unconfessed sin, there was no hidden sin, there was no sin that had not been dealt with in a required and appropriate manner. And so the counsel it so far offers may have been correct, but it was only correct where sin was evident. So all that he's motivated uh, to do here and to see accomplished in the life of Job, it's misplaced because there's no sin in Job's life. No way was Job suffering because of his sin. Sin was not the source of his suffering. So it's unfounded accusation. We've seen the unfounded accusations, the accusation of guilt, the accusation of naivety, the accusation with motivation, but we end then in verse 20 with this, an accusation with intimidation. It says in verse 20, But the eyes of the wicked shall fail, they shall not escape, and their hope shall be as the giving up of the ghost. Job, if you don't repent, you're going to die. God will end your life, and your days of opportunity will be past. 
Friend, make no mistake about it. This is simply intimidation. This is simply the final nail, as it were, and, and so far's argument to hammer it home and to prove the point that he is right and Job, there is something that Job needs to do. So far is incorrect here. But as he ends, he's simply engaging in intimidation. Once more proves to us that he was not someone who truly cared for nor loved Job in the appropriate way. It's worth pausing there just to reflect upon this. There are some who use the gospel in exactly that same way today. They preach hot condemnation. They preach hot judgment. They preach a hot hell. And they preach in a way that has been characterized as turn or burn. Almost rejoicing in the inevitable doom and destruction of the wicked. But friend, we are not to intimidate people into believing in Christ. We are not uh, indeed to intimidate them in or coerce them into believing in the gospel, receiving of Christ as their Savior. No, we are with compassion to save some from the fire. I know that you and I would not engage in this manner or behavior that is uh, typified here and exemplified here in the life of so far, but rather we would be those who preach, teach, and live in a compassionate way. Yes, preaching the truth. Yes, applying the truth. Being pointed in our application with the truth. No doubt about it. Preaching with a heart filled with compassion. Preaching with a heart's desire to see the lost one to Christ. To see the soul that is perishing and lost without him. Rescued from the inevitable doom of hell. Don't preach. Don't teach. Don't witness by intimidation. To do so is to fail in the obligations of our gospel ministry. And remember, as we said last week, the Holy Spirit's rule is to apply it to the person's heart. You and I are to be faithful in delivering it to the ear. And so we don't need to intimidate people into, or coerce people into doing what we believe they need to in light of the gospel. That's the Holy Spirit's rule. Always be mindful of that. And always be on the right side of that. So we see... Then, so far, criticisms and accusations are unfounded. But then we come, number two, to consider this. Unhelpful accusations. Not only are they unfounded, but they are unhelpful. Come with me to chapter 20 for this. Chapter 20 records for us the second uh, discourse of so far. And he uses the second discourse to simply further compound all that he has already said. And really, as we survey all three men, and as we consider the counsel that they offer, I believe it's true to say that they have all the same mantra. Maybe they rehearsed it as they were coming down the road together. But nevertheless, all of them seem to apply the same th- logic, the same thinking to that which they say. Sin brings suffering. Sin brings suffering. And whenever they say it, they mean it absolutely. There's the only reason a person suffers is because of sin. That's in essence what we can summarize into a concise statement, all that they say, all that they offer unto Job. Now so far as, as we've already mentioned, the most aggressive of the three, and therefore we term him the enforcer. He's there to hammer the points home. He's there to to leave Job in no doubt about how they felt. He speaks last and uh, each time, and instead of being willing to listen and reflect upon all that Job responds with, so far carries on regardless. He doesn't want to countenance any deviation from his supposition. That's why he typifies to us the battle of, a, of supposition, because he just assumes to the bitter end Job is guilty. He's intent on setting Job straight, and it appears that he will do or say anything to accomplish that goal. No tact, just cruelty. Here in verses 2 through 7 of this chapter, chapter 20, he says, Therefore do my thoughts cause me to answer. For this I make haste. I have heard the check of my reproach, and the spirit of my understanding causeth me to answer. Knowest thou not this of old, since man was placed upon earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short, the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment. 
Though his excellency mount up to the heavens, his head reach unto the clouds, yet he shall perish forever like his own dung, which they have seen him. Uh, and they which have seen him shall say, Where is he? In these verses, he is simply saying this, Job, no matter what you say, you're wrong. Do not know, Job, from days gone past, that's from the days of old, it's always been this way. Guilty men suffer. Wicked men are judged by God. The wicked will die prematurely. They'll not be able to enjoy the reward of their wickedness. And in verses 9 through 13 of this chapter, he pontificates about the ways and the desires of the wicked. A wicked man, he says, delights in evil. He's addicted to evil. Evil is sweet in his mouth. It says there, his, And the eye also which saw him shall see him no more, neither shall his place any more behold him. His children shall seek to please the poor. His hands shall restore their goods. His bones are full of sin from his youth, which shall lie down with him in the dust. Though wickedness be sweet in his mouth, though he hide it under his tongue, though he spare it and forsake it not, but keep it still within his mouth. He loves it. A wicked man loves wickedness. He's addicted to it. It's a sweet taste to him. But then he goes on in verses 14 through 19, and he comes to this conclusion. Surely as night follows day, it all ends in tears. It all ends in tears. Yet meat in his bowels is turned. It is a gall of asps within him. He has swallowed down riches. He shall vomit them up again. God shall cast them out of his belly. He shall suck the poison of asps. The viper's tongue shall slay him. He shall not see the rivers, the floods, the brooks of honey, the butter. That which he labored for shall he restore, shall not swallow it down again. According to his substance shall the restitution be. He shall not rejoice therein, because he hath oppressed and hath forsaken the poor, because he hath violently taken away a house which he builded not. It's all going to end in tears, Joe. For wicked men, that's their end. It all ends in tears. And then in the remainder of the chapter, verses 20 through 29, if all of that doesn't serve to prompt and provoke repentance within the wicked man, then the final act of God's judgment will be known. Verse 27, he says, Heaven shall reveal his iniquity. A wicked man in that moment was exposed for who he is and for what he has done. Heaven shall reveal all. Then in verse 23, he says, When he is about to fill his belly, God shall cast the fury of his wrath upon him and shall rain it upon him while he is eating. So heaven will reveal a wicked man for exactly who he is, and then heaven will judge him for exactly who he is. The fury of God will be known upon that individual. Why? Because they are wicked. They've delighted in wickedness. They've remained in wickedness. They've refused to repent from wickedness. And therefore, the fury of heaven will be known. Now, this entire chapter, he's not addressing Job personally. Rather, what he's doing is employing poetry. He's, enjoying, uh, he's employing a word picture to confirm his suppositions about Job. Simply, he's saying, this is a wicked man, Job. But you are that wicked man. As we sit together here in a, around a pile of ashes, you are that wicked man. And God is judging you. And if you're not careful, Job, then the full weight of God's judgment will be known. Heaven will expose you for the guilt that you have. And indeed, for the sin that is in your life, despite the fact that you're not willing to confess it now. If you are not willing to confess and repent, then heaven will expose it. And God will judge you. He'll wipe you out forever. It's interesting to think back to chapter 11. There in chapter 11, so far said, uh, Job couldn't fathom just how great God was. Couldn't fathom his justice. Couldn't fathom his knowledge. But here in this chapter, it seems that so far is taking the place of the hypocrite because he's, he said to Job, you can't fathom it. Here in chapter 20, he's saying, well, let me tell you all about it. He thinks he's the expert. He's sitting as a hypocrite here in this moment as we're looking at him. 
This chapter really deals with one of life's big questions. So far as dealing with it in many regards, even as he offers this counsel unto Job. But he's making a ham-fisted effort of answering it. There's no doubt about that. You see, remember, sin brings suffering is a mantra that all three friends had. And it underpinned, it undergirded all the counsel that they brought. And so, so far as conveying this picture of a wicked man, to so far the wicked are cut off and the righteous flourish. But is that true? I suggest to you it's bad theology. It's unscriptural. And it's far from reality. You only have to look around the world today. You only have to look into history. You only have to look into the Word of God and you will see numerous examples where wicked people have known prosperity, they have known longevity, and they have known lives of comfort and plenty. You consider the wicked king Manasseh. There wasn't a king like him who uh, led the nation into deep idolatry and backsliding, but he lived the longest among the king of Ju- kings of Judah. You consider history and you ask yourself this question, why did Joseph Stalin live to be 80 years of age? Millions of people died under his iron fist rule of the Soviet Union. But nevertheless, he lived to he was 80. You would think recently in our generation of Jimmy Savile, a man who died rich, a man who died lauded by all, until in subsequent years, of course, he was exposed for who and what he was. You look around the world today, look around our land and you ask yourself, why do drug dealers, why do paramilitaries, why do Republicans, why do they all prosper? Why do they all enjoy a a life of luxury and esteem? Why do the wicked prosper? That's a question that we ask ourselves many times, no doubt about it. And so far seeking the answer it here, but he's not answering in any way a biblical way. Come with me to Psalm number 73. Psalm in the number 73, and the psalmist here is a man by the name of Asaph. And he deals exactly with this question in this psalm. Why do the wicked prosper? Read with me in verses 1 through 9. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such that are as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. There are no bands in their death, their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them, about as a chain, violence taketh, or violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Here the psalmist is simply asking this. Why? Why do I look around and see the wicked flourishing? Why do I see the wicked prospering? Why do I see the wicked having more than heart could wish, she said? They're wicked. Why on earth are they enjoying the bountiful provisions of this world? Why are they living lives of comfort? Why? He says in verse 12, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Why? He looks at his own life, and in verse 13 he says, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain, washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. I look at my own life and I'm trying to do what's right by the word of God. I'm trying to live consistently, even for God. But nevertheless, I come to trouble, I face trial. There's plagues and persecutions that I know in my life. And I think to myself, why? The wicked are fine. The wicked are enjoying their lives. Their lives are filled with plenty. And I look within and I'm trying to do the best I can. And I'm struggling to make ends meet. I'm struggling with my health. I'm struggling with the comforts of life. I'm struggling to provide for my family. Why? Can you identify? I can. No doubt we all can at some season of our lives. Some stage of our lives. We've thought these thoughts. We've asked these questions. Then he says, 
Yes, it was all too painful for me. Verse 16, until. Something's about to change. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. He came to the place where God was. He came to the place where God's word resided. Therein, God's word was revealed to him this great truth. The wicked are doomed for destruction. The same grave that will claim your life and mine is the same grave the wicked will go to. And beyond the grave is not a life of bounty and provision as you and I look forward to as the children of God. No, beyond the grave for the wicked is eternal damnation, separation, and the eternal loss of their soul. And so as we ask ourselves these questions, the answers are clear in Scripture. Their temporal prosperity will one day be replaced by eternal damnation except they repent. So don't get disheartened as you look around this world. Don't get disheartened even by the uh, uh, seemingly increasing strength and wealth of the wicked. Look to God. Seek to live your life for him. Seek to win as many of the lost as you can to him. God will reward the wicked according to their transgressions. Verses 23, 22, he says, As one, when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I, and ignorant I was as a beast before thee. He's convicted about thinking these thoughts. I'm not standing here in condemnation of anyone who has thought them, I thought them myself. But in light of God's word, we are foolish to think such things. Because God is a God who is just. He can only do what's right. He will only do what's right. So the end for the wicked has always been decreed from God that the wicked who are unrepentant who do not close in on the offer of mercy and of grace in the gospel, and the wicked end up in eternal hell. And so let us be mindful of these things. You see, just like Asaph, we do well to focus not on what is going on in the lives of the wicked, but rather to remain focused upon the reward of the righteous, both now and in the time to come. He says in verse 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with me. Thou hast holding me by my right hand. The wicked don't know the continual presence of God, but you and I do. He is one who guides us with his eye. He is one who holds our hand and carries us through the toils, trials, and troubles of life. He's continually with us. Verse 24, Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. God is guiding us to that final day of our lives and that final day of our lives will usher us into his presence. Death is no fear for the believer. And therefore, life should have no fear for us either because we're looking forward to that day whenever we are with him. In verse 25, he, he also says, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. He's mindful that he has one in heaven who cares for him. And we have an advocate in heaven, even Jesus Christ the righteous. We have a loving Father in heaven who cares for us and meets and provides for every need. And here on earth we have a friend who sticketh closer than a brother, the Holy Spirit who is our constant guide and companion. Then in verse 26 he goes on and says, My, heart, my flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forevermore. Oh, the reward of the righteous is this, the eternal abundance of God's provision both now and in the life to come. And so we have his presence. We have that uh, hope that we will be ushered into glory and received into his presence. We have the advocate in heaven at this moment. We have a father in heaven. We have a comfort and guide here upon earth. And we know day by day his everlasting provision and that one day we shall enter into his eternal reward. So right now we do well to draw near to God. That's what he says in verse 28. It is good for me to draw near to God. 
Yes, we have many questions. Why do the wicked prosper? But we do well to draw near to God. We do well to put our trust in the Lord God. That's what Asaph did. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. And so as we live our lives here below, and yes, we can at times get distracted by all that's going on, and these questions can arise, let us draw near to God, let us trust in God, and let us never cease to declare His goodness, His greatness, His bountiful provision. Let us draw near to Him. And so we come back to so far. One whose counsel was unfounded. One whose counsel was unhelpful. Because what we should be doing, drawing near to God, trusting in God, declaring the goodness of God. And that leads me then to my third point. Not only unfounded accusation, unhelpful accusation, but unnecessary accusation. In light of all that we have just read there at the end of Psalm 73, that exhortation to draw near to God, that exhortation to trust in God, that exhortation to continually declare His goodness, all His works, we ask ourselves these questions. Were any of the accusations that so far brought true? Was any of the counsel that he offered necessary? No. We've now looked at the three men. and We've seen how that time after time they did and spoke that which was unnecessary. You can see quite clearly why the term Job's comforters has remained in use to this very day. It's always been synonymous with those who bring, uh, instead of bringing comfort and consolation, only bring discouragement and depression. That's why they're termed Job's comforters. And therefore, I believe the Word of God is reminding us through all of this that we're not to be a Job's comforter. We're not to be someone who brings misery instead of, indeed, uh, bringing that which comforts and strengthens. We're not to draw alongside and only ever emphasize the guilt and shame. We're not, be, we're not to be those who assume the wrongdoing of others. We're not to be those who guilt others into doing what we believe to be right. Sadly, too many people, even in our day and generation, live according to that. If that's you... You've got to break that cycle. You've got to break that cycle. Now, inevitably, we have conversations with friends. Inevitably, we seek to bring counsel even to those who are suffering, those who are experiencing hard times. So how can we do it in a way which brings necessary counsel? In a way that brings good outcomes and will be beneficial even to those whom we seek to be a blessing to. Well, I believe there's some guidelines that we can apply. We must at all times be mindful of that, which there's no doubt that these three men were mindful of. But nevertheless, they misapplied it. But that's where we begin. God is a God of justice. He can only do what's right, and he will only do what's right. We must believe that. We must never countenance the fact that God has made a mistake in anyone's life because our God doesn't make mistakes. He only does what is right. He can only do what is right. And so don't enter into these uh, conversations seeking to indeed uh, confirm, as it were, that God's in error, that something's happened, that something's out of a line, as it were, or out of, uh, out, of sc- out of the scope of God's plan. No, God is a God of justice. He can only do what's right. He will only do what's right. But nevertheless, our conversation should be marked by speaking much about God's love. God is a God of grace. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of unfailing compassion for his own. And yes, hard times may be permitted by God, but he ever remains a God of love. So as we speak one with another, especially in times when someone is experiencing those trials and troubles of life, speak much of God's love. Remind that brother, remind that sister that we serve a living God who loves us with an everlasting love and who is intimately concerned about our well-being. Yes, whilst he may have permitted that trial and difficulty to enter in, It doesn't remove in any way the knowledge of love that we enjoy. 
The knowledge of his love that we enjoy. So speak much of God's love. Emphasize God's peace. Many times, discouragement serves to rob us of a certain degree of our peace. These trials enter in and they're unsettling. They're hard to fathom. They're hard to comprehend. As we think them through to their bitter end, it's it's tough. Nevertheless, God's peace can always be known. Because God's peace is the everlasting possession of the child of God. So even in the midst of the darkest of ours, the peace of God is that which can be enjoyed by the child of God anywhere at any time. So speak much of God's love. Emphasize at all times the peace of God and remind them that that peace is able to be their portion. It's able to be their reality. It's available for them even in the toughest of times. But I would encourage you also, don't enter into blaming and shaming. Don't emphasize that guilt and that shame. Rather, remind them that Christ it was who came and bore our guilt and carried our shame. And there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. And so don't allow, even by the words you say, to bring discouragement or to emphasize the guilt. Don't allow opportunity to be given to the devil to hammer home that feeling of guilt. Because Christ bore our guilt. Christ carried our shame. By his stripes we are healed. There's no condemnation to them that are in Christ, to them that love God, to them that are loved by God. So don't emphasize guilt. Don't emphasize shame. Stay away from it. Speak much of God's love. Emphasize God's peace. Be a messenger of grace. Oh, may it be true of us today. Did you see a little of yourself in so far? I dare say we all did. Perhaps maybe not right now, but various instances or seasons of our lives. Let's do everything we can to rid that spirit of so far from us. Don't accuse the brother or the sisters. Don't bring on founded accusation. Don't bring on helpful accusations. Certainly don't bring on necessary accusations. Speak the truth in love, no doubt about it. But let love be the motivation. Let love, God's love, be the predominant theme. May God bless his word uh, to our hearts this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank thee and praise thee for all that thy word contains. We're thankful for the lessons that are to be learned therein. We pray that thou supply them to your heart right now. Lord, take thy word and use it in each of our lives to the praise and to the glory of thy name. Use it, O Lord, to the building up of our most holy faith. Help us, O Lord, to see the marvelous truth that is contained therein. And indeed, the marvelous message of hope that our God is a long-suffering, faithful, ever-loving and compassionate Father who one day will welcome us home. Until that day, help us to be faithful, pressing on to that mark, the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And we pray for that help and that grace to be our continual portion. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing our hymn together once more, and then our service will be brought to a close. May God bless each and every one of us, even throughout the remainder of today.